Thank you very much for joining us. And um, we are talking today about um, obstacles that come up um, for yoga practitioners and actually for anyone in life if you're wanting to engage in life. And um, we started thinking of this as a uh, kind of study in how obstacles are something that really have been around from time immemorial and are they change with history. They change with the way people um, are as cultures. Um, but they also are kind of the same. Um, and most of you have are very familiar with the Yoga Sutra. The Yoga Sutra being a book and a, a, a way of studying that's really based in the Sankhya philosophy, which is essentially the oldest Oldest official, official school, school. metaphysics, yeah. 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 And um, in the Yoga Sutra, in the first chapter, verse 30, um, after they've talked about um, the citta vrittis and the difficulties that we as humans <clears throat> have with our minds, um, there is a verse that talks about obstacles. And so that's when we think of obstacles as yoga practitioners often that's where we turn and what we look at as, oh, this is the gold standard of obstacles. Am I suffering <clears throat> from any of them? <clears throat> and the obstacles that are listed there are things like uh, sickness and sloth, which uh, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that glorious feeling of sloth. Um, and then also things like, you know, not being able to get into a yogic state or not being able to hold on to a yogic state. Yeah, which the, they say the inability to get a bhumi, which means a bhumi means a, a, an earth or a planet. And so you don't, kind of, you don't get grounded. And, uh, yeah. and so you can't <laughs> like just go, ah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, That's like, an in the very place. early times of people studying metaphysics, studying yoga, practicing yoga, it was part of human nature that obstacles would arise. Um, and then the way within the Yoga Sutra that, that right after that verse, in the next, you know, like, 31, 32, for a few, maybe five or six verses, there are... Uh, suggestions for what can help, one of them being inhaling, exhaling, and pausing, <clears throat> which is a good way of focusing the mind. And they were all talked about as essentially, even though sickness or sloth were two of them, or not being able to attain yogic states, uh, they were all talked of, about as essentially distractions of mind. So it boils down to how we become distracted in the mind, which is obviously why you know, they follow logically after the Chittavritti explanation. Um, so if we think of obstacles as mind distractions, but then they manifest kind of in a different way, not only in the mind, they manifest um, in sort of emotional states. And the ones in the Yoga Sutra that are mentioned are things like sorrow um, and a few other things. But, you know, you, you essentially, they, are, they manifest through lack of equanimity. And so when we practice yoga, one of the uh, side effects is that over long periods of time when you practice, the capacity to drop into a state of, of equanimity um, is easier and easier. And so also looking at um, the obstacles, in addition to playing with the breath, one of the suggestions is that you practice the Brahma-viharas, you practice compassion, uh, you practice 
kindness, you practice upekshanam. Um, and we've talked about that in other talks. So we, at the end of this talk, may come back around to some of the ways one can sort of work with obstacles. But we're thinking that one of the most interesting parts about obstacles and yoga is that, as we said, they, you know, okay, back in the time of the Sakya, these were the ones that were written about. And then you look today in today's world, and there are also obstacles that are kind of along the same lines as these, but they have their modern twist to them. And we'll look at those towards the end too. But if you follow that trajectory from the Yoga Sutra to today, also obstacles were spoken of in the bhakti tradition, which came quite a bit later yeah. than Sankhya. Yeah? Under that name. Yeah, under uh, that name. Yeah. I mean, it existed, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love, love existed even pre-human. Oh, God, but... that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but under that name. Under that name. Yeah, and so, um, and so, of course, the Bhagavad Gita is talking extensively about bhakti. That's, mm-hmm. um, and... Um, and uh, it's, but later on, bhakti then it evolved from you know, the days of the Mahabharata uh, to the days of early hatha yoga and tantra. Uh, bhakti was a coevolution of that, mm-hmm. uh, which is logical. And so it's fun to kind of look at, you know, the some of the teachings that the bhakti, uh, I was going to say cults, which is actually just means families. Cults means families. <laughs> you can't get, you can't live with them, you can't live without them. Um, and, uh, and this really helps us see the, uh, gives us a, a rounded view of what to do. And, uh, and so, let's see. And one of the things about the bhakti movements, and it's important to realize that uh, is they are a little bit more aware of embodiment in a separate, in a different way. Because uh, I remember what you were talking about the obstacles in the Yoga Sutra, and then after that list of obstacles like sickness, it says, "Oh, you you know you have this attachment and repulsion," and then. Even the you'll even have to inhale and exhale, you know, <laughs> implying that oh, all of these obstacles are states within the subtle body of the breath, mm-hmm. uh, states within the system of the nadis, uh, and so, um, and one of the things that the devotional or the bhakti movement involves is. Uh, this, ex- you know, in which they kind of enshrine love uh, rather than, you know, escape or, you know, the word, it is just a, a term. And, oh, let's put love at the top. And love is the, the true being. Love is who we all are. Love, that's who Krishna really is. That's who Shiva really is. That's who the Buddha really is. That's who you really are. That's who you really are. <laughs> and uh, what that involves. And so there's much more expression uh, in the initial uh, patterns of movement in the body. Uh, and so there's much more dancing. There's much more uh, theatrical uh, gesturing, uh, like classical Indian dance is very much expression. So, and so there's that... Uh, looking at emotion as sacred. Mm-hmm. Uh, not necess- it's not what you actually are. It's what, in the Sankhya terms, it's, it's all prakriti. Right. You know, which, if you ever needed something to fall back on, you say, well, it's all prakriti. <laughs> which Malibanda. means it's all impermanent. And then say Mulabandha. <laughs> yeah, <it's all> 
That's right. <laughs> um, and so there's, uh, I'm just thinking of, uh, and so in, even in, if you look, if you travel to the, to the Sufi traditions of, of Islam, uh, they are also part of what I believe to be even an older tradition, older than, you know, these early Judeo-Christian Islamic traditions of you know, this experience, uh, you know, that was in that was part of ancient cultures, and so it survives that way. In which, uh, you know, singing is, of course, that's traditional in so many cultures, among every culture. But then, singing and dancing, and then movement to express uh, either devotion or to express fidelity. Uh, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. uh, this happens. So I was just thinking there's one little list of obstacles <laughs> that just uh, keeps popping up. And, uh, and this is, these are six things that destroy love. And, uh, if I can remember, Atyahara, Prayasas Cha. I have to say the whole thing because <laughs> it's just, it's like a song. And then I think, well, Atyahara prasas cha prajalpa niyama graha jana sangas cha loeryam shat bhakti vinashati. These six things destroy bhakti or love. And the first is atyahara. And it's real simple. And you, I'm familiar. It means uh, overeating is the initial thing. It's just consuming too much. Uh, and so it's not just food, but it's just consuming too much. And you can think of whatever it is, too much uh, Netflix, too much internet, uh, too much beer, wine. Uh, Overconsumption. Uh, Overconsumption of, of substances. Yeah, or of, you know, shopping. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Achihara can be oh, shopping too much. Uh, <laughs> Uh, an obsession is any yeah. kind of obsession with those immediately addictive and pleasurable things, but it also atyahara also means not doing enough of it. In other words, I say, oh, overeating is one of the destroyers of bhakti. So I just won't eat, and uh, and so it's also arranged so that it also if you undereat, you're going to destroy it also, or if you deny any type of, this is just part of the natural embodiment mechanism, is that that uh, consumption. So if you go to either extreme, and I was just thinking of, you know, in the, the Buddha, when he first, you know, left the palace, he hung out with a bunch of extremists, and they were into ati ahara, and they wouldn't eat, and so there's the, you know, the, the famous artwork of the fasting, you know, and you, and uh, some of us have done this before, and, and you fast, and you get this kind of dizzy high, and um, you can do good backbends for a while till you yeah. pass We've out. Yeah, many yoga till students. you pass out. Yeah, eating <laughs> disorders uh, are also <laughs> included yeah. in that, and it's so like you know. Eating is good, but don't eat too much, don't eat too little. It's a, describing, of course, a middle path. that, uh, uh, Which is interesting um, with, you know, the difference with bhakti, with the warmth that bhakti really brought into the tradition. Because Sankhya is this amazing foundation, but then it turns into kind of like... In some people's minds. Yeah, it, it in some people's minds, like, like, you know, kind of severe, kind of furrowed-browed old guy sitting around, you know, yeah. getting a little... It's just perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and every tradition has yeah. people who do that. <laughs> Even we do that occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> every few minutes or so. Um, and then the, the next one, Atyahara, uh, prayasyas. Prayasya is to, like, really endeavor, you know, to, like... And, uh, and of course, there are things you want to really endeavor for within the devotion. You want to 
endeavor for the happiness of all beings. Uh, you want to, but oftentimes, if you find yourself, uh, particularly in yoga practice, uh, clenching your teeth to the point that you can actually break your own teeth through biting, or biting your tongue, or making really grunting sounds, uh, holding you, you know, trying to do like a, a certain advanced posture and holding your breath, and then there's an explosion of air or breaking of bones, tearing of ligaments. That is what they're talking about. And this, of course, that's on the immediate level, but in, say, just in pranayama, if you do that too much, and this is one of the, you know, you, you can really uh, damage yourself mm -hmm. uh, or damage others who are sitting nearby. Um, <laughs> And so that's on the physical. And then that extreme pushing is something that's emotion. Is it indicates a kind of uh, neurotic attachment that, and so it's making you actually disembodied or unaware of what's going on. And so it becomes an obstacle. Yeah, even if you're doing something that is embodied. Um, it's an embodiment exercise that is just, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's a way of short circuiting. Without, without kindness. Yeah. yeah. And in, in Ashtanga yoga, sometimes there is this, um, you know, there is that kind of drive that people find themselves in uh, in certain phases or in any kind of pursuit of yoga. You know, I've got my way, and then it becomes this. You know, it really is this idea of the obsession that uh, has yeah. is unkind to you and to others. Yeah, and it's also we have to realize it's natural to do this. Yeah. I guess that you know, it's all the divine ego function. Uh, you know, because that's what makes us. That's what manifests time and space and stuff. But mm -hmm. but in the bhakti school, you see, oh, you just. Uh, uh, kind. Oh, so the next obstacle, uh, oh, prajalpa. And jal is to talk and blabbing uh, or gossiping. I think gossiping is probably. Uh, and of course, you know, talking is wonderful. We mean to communicate. But gossiping is usually. Uh, when the, the language and the talking is, has triggered some kind of uh, ambition or envy or finally we get to talk, because usually gossip is about those other people. Uh, <laughs> or I'm gossiping, you know, I want to spread you know, good rumors about myself and so I'll be gossiping. And, uh, and this can really cause destruction uh, to you and to others to gossip. And, uh, and when you think about it, not that any of you have ever gossiped or listened to gossip, but when you think about that, what <laughs> it might feel like for someone, um, and what it, you know, what these states are like in sort of the intuitive embodiment of them, uh, and this sort of, you know, sort of the the sort of what happens in the core of the body where we, we all know we're supposed to have hearts that hold all beings in our hearts and when we do something in particular like gossiping or gossiping about ourselves on social media um, to to really check in with what is happening in my physical body in say, the core of the core of the heart, that's where you really start understanding, oh, you know, I'm, maybe this is, is, has some other motivation other than uh, giving good, solid, helpful information to it. Yeah. Because when you are really being helpful to others, the feeling is very different from when you are gossiping about others or gossiping about yourself, you know, gossiping in a negative way towards yourself in a mind you state where you're, you know, sort of just critical or 
uh, non-critical of yourself. What is the embodied yeah. feeling there? Yeah, like you can become obsessed with imagining what your neighbors are over there. They're, you think, oh, they're talking about me again. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's a kind of uh, negative. And you feel it in your breath. You mm -hmm. feel it in, you know, the... Closing of the heart and this obsession of the mind. So what's the next Pulajapa? Oh, Niyama Agraha or Niyama Graha. And it goes both ways. So the Niyamas are like in the Yoga Sutra. These are like uh, practices, you know, like cleanliness, uh, contentment. Uh, what are the other ones? Uh, <laughs> I never remember past those first two. But... Uh, these are disciplines, uh, and it said that if you hold them too tightly, uh, and then that's it becomes an obstacle. And uh, so the niyamas are or oh, Ishvara Purani is mm -hmm. the final, oh, and Smriti yeah. uh, Samadhi Ishvara Purani. So these, um, if you grasp them. Uh, too tightly, that's considered to be an obstacle. Or, and of course, this the funny thing about this little group of is if you hold them too loosely, <laughs> so if you're too tight or too loose with the niyamas, and these are just the practical disciplines, like I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be clean. And that's the first one. And so uh, we've known the occasional person who is they're just too clean. Uh, in other words, there's not a speck of dirt uh, anywhere. And uh, this is their kind of uh, obsessive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it gets in the way of sort yeah. of the natural process of things. Yeah. And then there are others who... Uh, we know a few of those. Yeah, we know a few <laughs> of those who see the sacredness of dirt. Oh, they are, <laughs> and, they, uh, and, and so it's an individual thing, but... Uh, you can overdo either way, and uh, but all of those are difficult. Uh, let's see, and the next one. Uh, uh, oh, jhana sangha, and so sangha we know. Oh, that's that's the community, uh, but jhana just means um, uh, people, just people in general, and it's kind of like people who are not into. Uh, you know, just dilution, d diluted people, you know, just like uh, distant <coughs> relatives in your family uh, that, uh, or uh, people who love gossiping. <laughs> Those are jhana sanghas. Um, and so that can be also difficult. And of course, the extreme of that is, well, if you are critical enough, you see that all, all embodied beings are, so you won't associate with anybody. And, uh, hard to survive that way. And that, again, is one where, um, and, and it's very relevant, I think, to today's world, where um, you are, you know, find a group of people who you communicate with, and it can, can be either so closed that you only talk to the people who agree with you. And, and it's, in a sense, when you find yourself in situations where you're not willing to uh, enter into dialogue with open-mindedness to hear views that are counter to you um, or where you are entering into dialogues and you don't really listen even to the people who have the same views as you because if you hear a little seed that reinforces one of your beliefs, it feeds you. Um, and so what can happen is that you might have the right community because it's like sort of hanging out with the right people is part of what this is talking about, hanging out with people who are supportive of, of love and which, of yoga. Which, which is extremely helpful. Yeah. yeah. But then if that's the only perspective you get, that can go off down this road, as Richard was talking about, you know, kind of a community can slip into being a cult or a... Clo it doesn't even have to be 
a cult, but a closed-minded um, group rather than uh, grounded, which is still important, and mm. uh, clear, and open-minded group with clear thinking and clear ideas that can stand the um, test of dialogue. Mm. And so the, yeah. this kind of obstacle is one that does come up where, you know, it's almost a fear of challenging one's own beliefs and one's own ideas. That's the other side of <clears throat> hanging out with kind of, you know, thugs and the mafia, is that you hang out with the saints who are closed-minded saints. <laughs> <laughs> and then it becomes, it becomes, friendly, yeah, yeah, who are not, I mean, that's what's wonderful coming back around to yeah. remembering this as bhakti. There are people who don't um, kind of embody a sense of genuineness and authenticity and real care for others. Um, and, you know, we, I, I think one of the things that happened during the pandemic is that because we were all so closed off, and, you know, we had our little bubbles, and we had then the internet, um, a certain amount of miscommunication uh, got started in this, in this way. And then, of course, there were forces from outside that were trying to help people not think well, but perhaps. But, um, you know, a lot of confused thinking happened during that time. So we're coming out of that time. Um, the practices of yoga are so powerful because they bring you into, whether you want to or not, they bring you into the central channel of the body, and which is where bhakti, love, kindness, all those things, that's where they are, whether that's, you want them or not. Right, if you're a bhakta, that's where the beloved lives. Uh, <clears throat> and... One of the requirements in bhakti is that you see the beloved in all beings. Mm -hmm. uh, but what happens uh, is we get the idea of, the, oh, the beloved is Krishna, who looks exactly like this. And you look around at all other beings who are kind of like... Not blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a dark blue color, you know. Um, and, and you're not actually seeing that's who they actually are is that beloved, and that's who you actually are, and uh, not the image that is a useful image in terms of uh, teaching you about uh, embodiments, about chakras, nadis, you know, the, the artwork is beautiful, but you grab that, and uh, it becomes like a, a separate little closed thing that is then actually a, a potentially a cause of suffering. Uh, and so even when you find a beautiful, you know, there's just the term bhakti, I, I do bhakti. And then right there I've exposed, you know, something, and it's called, one of my favorite is, look at me, bhakti. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's not bhakti, but yeah, but you should look at me do it. And uh, it's not looking at the other and it's an inability to see the other in all beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and because uh, we reduce the other being to some theory about them, and we're not actually in that central channel. Uh, nirodha, the ecstasy of Nirodha, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually the wow. teaching of Bhakti. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the nature of Bhakti, uh, there's a beautiful Narada Bhakti Sutra that probably you've heard me rant about, um, but it, it's saying that it's the nature of bhakti, which is love, is nirodha. And nirodha is, of course, often interpreted by critics of the Yoga Sutra or many of its practice as stopping. You know, and it has a bit of a uh, whacking, you know. Yeah. Chitta vrittis are bad, so you... And, and yet... The nature of it is, and but that's the nature of being with the beloved is like, oh. and so the 
practice. So what's the next one? Prajapa, Niyama Praha, Jana Sangas. Oh, and Lalyam. Lalyam is just uh, this kind of pining, pining away, like, oh. And uh, and that's one is considered uh, not pining. It's fine to pine away for the beloved, uh, but often we're pining away for. Uh, it's kind of like what we kind of dream about, or when we're sitting around. You know, this is what I really want, and you're just lost in. Uh, and it implies, you know, it's, it, it has a sexual implication, but it also is like, uh, for, I'm pining away for, you know, when I uh, am a billionaire and I have my own multinational. <laughs> we know now, because that's oh. like the hundredth time you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not real... <laughs> Yeah, I need help with that. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's pining away. That's lolly. Yeah, and it's, it's and it's a it's a way of your disembodied. Usually, your posture. Uh, if sometimes you're meditating for a long time and you find yourself in this twisted thing, and you know you haven't noticed your inhale or exhale for the last uh, ten minutes yeah. uh, or two days or something, and you're often lost in lolly. And it's it's very much, would you say, sort of like the epitome of not being in the present moment. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you notice it, then you're in the present moment, and that's a good thing. But then you probably go off into it again. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... Um, yeah, and and of course in the modern world, uh, these are, mm-hmm. you know, it, as Mary was saying, you know, the, the the same obstacles. I'm sure even and even non-humans have obstacles. Well, <laughs> I've noticed, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, some of them are better at dealing with it. You know, they'll. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because they're more embodied, in at least for their species, and so the the confront an obstacle and uh, dealing with survival. Um, but in, and in the modern world, the this particular one, um, and and all of them really are so influenced by the fact that we are so interconnected through media, and and so there is both this deep connection that we get by being in, in contact with each other in something like a, a conversation online. But then there is this distortion that gets put in because of the belief systems of other people that you have no idea who they are. And it's, it's sort of like cultural marketing rather than you know, even some evil marketing company marketing. It's, you know, so... Um, one of the things that happens these days is is the pining away for things or the attachment to things or you know some of the other obstacles they are compounded by the state that we are all living in where we're both intimately connected and and profoundly disconnected from one another so as modern day practitioners one of the things that can be very Helpful is to to know about the nature of obstacles that have existed over time and have been talked about by different schools, and then look at how are things like that um, manifesting in my own hab- habitual patterns and in my own daily behaviors. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt it before the last. What isn't there one more? No. No, that was it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for obstacles all over the place. <laughs> yeah, give me some more. And so, as yoga practitioners, what we do is 
you know, when you say you have an obstacle, what happens, how you start to notice it is that um, the obstacle may not be what you notice, but in your practice, you notice maybe that you can't get on the mat or you can't get on the sitting cushion or you do go to sit and you're, you know, drinking your tea, lighting your incense and, <clears throat> you know, adjusting your seat, but you're not really doing the practice or or that you do this strong practice, this is kind of like one of these obstacles, and you have this rigid, strong practice that you're overdoing and that you won't uh, step away from, um, and you plateau. So it either kind of goes off into the gutter or you plateau, and those are uh, direct signs that there's some obstacle um, that mm -hmm. you need to kind of pause within your interfacing with, with life, with your practice, with the world, and say, what is it that is off kilter here? Because if we think back to <clears throat> the Yoga Sutra and, you know, that these are states that arise that are actually connected to mind states and to the embodied state. Um, we have the tools we need to say, what's my special little version of these that I'm playing out in my tiny little story here? Because we all, you know, when we mm -hmm. were thinking about this talk, one of the things that struck me was, you know, you think you have an obstacle and, okay, I'm going to fix it. But, you know, one, of, one way to look at it that, that's a little gentler and a little more um, kind of gives you a little more freedom is to look at the fact that if you didn't have obstacles, you wouldn't be a human being. You know, human beings come <laughs> here, and that's part of who we are is we have these... It's, it is our nature um, to have habits, to have difficulties of this kind. And so then you say, wow, what is it that can bring me back to a more fully embodied state um, that can allow this obstacle to sort of dissolve, just like with the Nirodha, let it suspend and then it just dissolves rather than trying to fix it, which is the so, flaw that yeah. a lot of us get well, into. One of the, the beautiful things about the bhakti and then related tantric schools is they'll start to look at things that we would consider obstacles. Um, but if you can bring in the uh, the, the vision that this is the beloved, mm -hmm. okay, through through the box, then pining away is considered a divine rasa or flavor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's you know it's uh, and it's is it is you know it's part of what takes you into a deeper samadhi mm -hmm. um, or jealousy. Um, and so you're not trying to get, you just see, but who is jealous of what? And so with that, and so all of these emotions and disappointment or anger are also, these are considered divine uh, emotions. And uh, they're often deities or you know, a lot of beautiful art that represents them as divine. And so the bhakti school really allows you to see that. Mm -hmm. um, and whereas you know it, and other schools also if you really read deeply you say oh they're all bhakti schools but uh, it's more like oh that's bad I'm going to get rid of it I, one of the things we were talking about with all these kind of wacky sort of manifestations of bhakti like you know dancing and singing throwing your arms up hiccuping you know Remember, we were oh, yeah. talking about this. It's like these are just these physical symptoms of, of almost interrupting the plodding along 
and the, yeah, as the central channel opens, yeah. you know, you you might uh, hiccup, hiccup, or, or yawn. Yeah, so <laughs> that's my favorite one. And, or burping is also yeah. Burping is thought to be very bu- filled well, with. And of bucket. course, your hair standing up, <laughs> like the whole idea, of course, you know, all of your hair stands straight up on end, and these are considered oh, but don't get attached to them, and you know. <laughs> Uh, I'll cultivate getting my hair to stand on end by rather, getting a mohawk. Yeah, getting, <laughs> getting a mohawk, and and of course you know the 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 wonder of uh, the internet, social media, and stuff just makes it so uh, you can't live with it. You can't live without it. Okay. The, uh, And so, in terms of one's own practice um, and going more deeply <clears throat> without attachment to that happening, like being content with being where you are, um, not trying to uh, nail down the fifth series, not trying to become the, you know, dictator that you sometimes talk about, not trying to be something that you're not, um, is part of really the message that these obstacles are Mm -hmm. giving to us, that when you are over-striving, over-attaching, detaching or detaching from reality too much, um, you do get cloudy thinking, and you do get the sense of disembodiment and this almost obsession with doing what you have decided upon as being what you should do um, with very little regard for other. Um, and when you mention other creatures who you know, have obstacles, it's, it seems from a human perspective when you look at them out here in this jungle that they, um, you know, yeah, they run into obstacles, but they never seem to lose sight of the context of where they are. And and that's how they've survived. And that that this is one big ecosystem, and they're an important part of it, but they're not the only part. And as humans with the capacity to develop really healthy and sometimes... um, overly healthy egos, we lose sight of that. We lose sight of how vital it is to uh, feel connected and to live in that state of seeing our context. Richard and I have been working on a new project and um, really looking at how embodiment uh, works in terms of things like happiness, things like uh, suffering, um, things like the Brahma Viharas and the obstacles. And as we, so you know, you toss the word embodiment out, and what does that mean? And as we start pulling it apart a little bit, um, you know, you can look at it almost as though embodiment really is the human expression of what in yoga might be talked of as the koshas, the different levels of, of what it means to be embodied in this human form, from, you know, the, the physical bones and blood and body itself, and the breath, mm-hmm. and then the states of mind that go from clarity and ego to sort of a deeply interconnected state. And all of those aspects of our daily experience, they have to be coordinated like, you know, in in an orchestra to be fully embodied, um, which is... Yeah, to be embodied. And and I was just thinking of the... uh... Satipatthana Sutta, the mm-hmm. early teachings of the Buddha, and because it's all about embodiment at the very beginning, um, that 
you know, as you practice embodiment, you start to see, well, of course I'm not this fingernail. And then let's, and so you're, but then we keep going to deeper and deeper experiences of the body. And the, then you see that the mind and the body are prana. Mm -hmm. You can't really separate them. One manifests as the other. And so the true embodiment is this, you know, it's just another word, mm -hmm. but it actually means uh, bhakti. Yeah. <laughs> it means love, whatever that means. Uh, that's actual yeah. embodiment. And of course, um, and so when you feel the, an obstacle, and you, you know, you realize you may not know what the obstacle is, but you know there's some glitch in this sort of continuum of body, breath, mind. There's some glitch that's not feeling like you have disappeared. You keep popping in as your same irritating self or your same glorious self, depending on who you happen to be. And, <laughs> and so that's a sign then to stop and to look closely and to, to, to have uh, discriminating awareness, to use discriminating awareness, meaning looking at closely at the process of the, sense, the senses coming and mm. being reacted to and acted upon, etc., and then starting over and over. And so you, you look closely at discriminating how you are practicing or not practicing discriminating awareness and then with a real um, clear and authentic and truthful gaze within you to see am I really truly um, in this for myself or am I really truly in it to be of part of a bigger picture and which means embodying interconnectedness the way that lizard would out in the jungle. Yeah. And it's a good idea to keep the question open. Mm -hmm. uh, it's imperative to keep the question open. <laughs> right, because you're coming to a yeah, I'm in it for the... Yeah, I'm in it for others, get out of my way. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm not in it for others. But, yeah. And so the, that, that giving of space the Bible, of, which is represented, uh, you know, as listening. You know, so the first thing is you just like listen, and then oh, and that listening will then cause you know the uh, then in listening then your habitual uh, those things that really uh, make you want to. Relax, okay, because listening is then like, and the breath slows down, and then the, then you just want to like, s s sing your song, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're starting to go into these deeper states. And this is... And then... The deeper states make you want to actually be of service mm -hmm. to others. So the the uh, one of the symptoms of the path is that you you just want to be helpful, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you want to be helpful to the point where you're willing to try something, and then get the feedback <laughs> from others. Oh, by the way, that that was just terrible. <laughs> Thanks, but don't do that again either. Okay, and then uh, you're willing to adjust that. And, uh, yeah. uh, shall we open? Yeah, I have, yeah. yeah. I, I think, you know, to remember too that obstacles, you know, part of why in yogic sort of lore, and it's very popularized these days, that Ganesh is the sort of taker away of obstacles. 
uh, both because he doesn't take things literally and because he has such a wonderful sense of humor. And he sees that, as we all do, that these obstacles are actually, they're the path. They are the doorways yeah, that are, are the there if we would just open the door and go through that obstacle rather than, um, and, and to, so whether you are, you know, and, and things like you have the death of a, a loved one and there's profound suffering that arises for you and sorrow and grief. And if you can, at the appropriate time, not necessarily immediately, it might be even years later, but go into that full experience of the suffering and beyond it um, of to, to really watch the transformative impact mm -hmm. that being able to merge with the complexities and the difficulties that we run into, that that has on you and that you then have on others and they then have on others. Whereas if, as practitioners, we run into obstacles and we avoid them or we overthink them or we mm -hmm. you know, toss them out the window, then that um, sort of carelessness, rather than careful, being careful with something, that carelessness is uh, perpetuated in the world. Because you do that, the person sees you doing that, they do that, etc. Yeah. So it really starts and you with lost in yeah. The you actually can make it worse. Yeah, and, and so the, the the teaching of Ganesh is Ganesh is the obstacle, mm -hmm. and and so if you're having, uh, and it could be you know from terrible pain uh, to <laughs> neurotic. Why do you thoughts. always look at me? <laughs> <laughs> um, or crazy, but to say, oh, that's Ganesh is automatically, that is a very clever way of reframing it. Oh, this is sacred. And you're then able to like watch it. So you've kind of broken the uh, prana chitta cycle, mm -hmm. you know, where the, the sensations are being sort of ignored and so it puts up the story and the story reinforces the sensation to say, oh, this is, the obstacle itself is Ganesh, uh, meaning that it's like, oh, this is the the great mystery, and this is the and Ganesh is uh, kind of sweet, you know. He's at least a good comedian, and uh, he's got a big nose, okay, and big ears, big belly, and so then you you're all of a sudden, oh, you're looking again, and you, what you're feeling, then you're actually feeling the. Uh, sensations, you're doing spriti, just with that very clever trick of mm -hmm. like, this, these obstacles are Ganesh. And that way you're not trying to get rid of the obstacle. Because uh, then, that would be, you know, who would want to get rid of the, the, it's impossible. the best comedian? You know? Yeah, it's impossible anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very, uh, yeah devotional trick. Mm -hmm. And so, and if it, other schools will say, oh, that obstacle, that is Shiva, that is Krishna, that is, you know, the emptiness. So, and it's, uh, there we are back at the beginning of the practice. Yeah. So we, you know, we've, we've kind of skirted around some of this and given you some ideas to play with. But we really invite you to notice the times that you, you, you have these signals, the plateau, the difficulty practicing, the um, confusion that you might feel, or heightened emotions like anger or, or um, jealousy or sorrow. And or guilt, you know, to notice those and and rather than becoming um, sucked in by them or trying to fix them, to turn towards them and to see them as these really wonderful um, 
sort of cues that your your whole embodied experience are they're cues that that you're being given that maybe you've dropped a little bit out of a state of equanimity um, and and that's okay that once you notice that by continuing to refocus the mind and to as the yoga sutra says in the end of this section on those obstacles is you know maybe you do you focus on something opposite to what you is bothering you or maybe you focus on a divine being that you you know your ishta devata or the dalai lama or someone you think is really got it together or if none of that works you just focus on anything and yeah. you start concentration Excellent. of the mind which then allows you to disappear and that's what feels so good about yoga for I think most of us is that we have these moments where we ourselves disappear and and it's not as though we've been annihilated but we've just become part of this inter interpenetrating um, matrix that is life to the point that that's what it's all about and it feels glorious and that's a real state of freedom so when you're feeling not free not happy etc that's the opportunity to you know drop into the body the mind and connect to others and to the rest of the world. And things kind of sort themselves out in a funny way on their own. Mm -hmm. so. We, uh... yeah. so we hope this was helpful, or at least brought up some questions, because um, questioning is where it's at. So we will um, be back again. We appreciate so much you tuning in. And uh, we'll sign off now, but also stay around for questions. Thank you. <laughs>